all CEOs, me included, we don't actually know what we're doing. They're all sharks, so all you got to do, though, is no shark bait. I don't think we've ever talked about this before. <laughs> we can capture all of the wallet share. First place you start is with the product. That's just the first nut. This is the Capital Stack. Hey, everybody. Thank you for tuning into the Capital Stack, where I am your host, David Paul, where I talk to the world's greatest founders, operators, and investors about all things value creation. Today is a very special day because this today is the first day that I am having a guest on twice. And I actually hate it that you're the only guest that I've actually repeated, but you're doing something different, but it's you. So it's bothering me. Rahul Sidhu, the founder and CEO of Aerodome, which is a drone company for the public safety sector. Rahul, how are you doing? I'm doing well, man. Uh, I'm glad to be back, but as me, but with a different thing. Um, dude, you don't look that great right now. Like, uh, it's a, it's a part of a new purposeful disheveled look. Um, <laughs> oh, okay. It's I'm growing my hair out and I'm just trying to be like this cool, like I wear sweaters and have disheveled hair guy. Um, so it's like a really early midlife crisis for me, but yeah, it's working out. I think before it was, it was kind of obnoxious. You kind of had this like male model Bollywood thing going. Yeah. Yeah. And I, I felt like that was a, a little too clean cut, honestly. Um, and, uh, my girlfriend's like, Hey, uh, like one day I rolled out of bed and she's like, your hair has never looked better. And it was okay. just like disheveled. I'm like, Oh, okay. Let me lean into this a little bit. So okay. that's what we're doing I like here. it. That's what we're I doing. like it. Yeah. So give us a story where we'll tell us the, the, give us in case you haven't listened to it. We do have another episode with Rahul on spider tech, but give us a 10 second on spider tech and your transition to aerodome. Yeah. Look, uh, so uh, my, my big thing is, um, both public safety and tech. I try to bridge the gap and, uh, spider tech, my previous company was acquired in July of 2021. And that whole company's thesis was again around public safety. Uh, which started in 2015, was around this idea that public perception for chief executives in the world of public safety is going to shift from reducing crime as the main performance metric to improving public per- perception um, is the main performance metric. So um, that was the whole thesis. And we built an automated customer service platform around this with the idea that on one side, it's going to measure every interaction between the police, for example, and a 911 caller. So every time you call 911, uh, you have to fill out a survey that says, hey, like, you know, it'll be texted to you. How's your interaction with the dispatcher? How's your interaction with the officer, the detective, et cetera? And agencies for the first time ever can really kind of measure their customer service score. And then um, we also built the ability to kind of automate the customer service process, which would improve these interactions by sending you an update. Hey, here's what you called 911 about. Here's what you uh, called, uh, you know, like here's an update on your case, et cetera. Just like when you buy something online and you get that click here to track your order, your item shipped, your items delivered, you know, fill out the survey. We basically built that entire stack. And uh, the company went well. I mean, it, it, we became profitable towards the end there and sold in peak Zerp era. Uh, so I can't complain. Um, and that's kind of what launched me into this next thing. Which is? Well, uh, it's Aerodome. And what we built is the ability to essentially send a drone to any 911 call in a jurisdiction in an average of 98 seconds to be able to provide air support for the public safety personnel, fire and police that are responding to that scene. And this is all based off of an experiment I ran in 2020, in March of 2020. Uh, still acting as a reserve officer in the Los Angeles area, where I started sending drones in March to uh, 911 calls. The basis being that we were down 30 to 40 percent of our staff because of COVID, and the helicopter units were were down because you know for essential personnel. So I tried to uh, you know make something happen by sending drones to calls directly from the police department. We were limited from a regulatory standpoint on what we were allowed to do, but um, I'd say it, on the third day I sent a drone out uh, to a 911 call where there's an attempted murder. And the suspect tried to get away, and I sent a drone almost a mile out uh, from the police station, and was able to catch this guy before the before he got on the freeway, uh, and the officers were able to arrest him. And this became like an aha moment. Wow, wow, okay, we did that in like less than two minutes. 
uh, this is this is something that's pretty game changing. Let's let's dive deeper into this. And it turned into a full time kind of police program at, in uh, at my agency. And then multiple agencies after that started trying something similar. The New York Times did a whole piece on this, and it was clear to me that uh, this is the future. But if I'd spun this program up in 2020, it would have been way too early. We had to wait until 2023 where the technology, you know, potential existed to be able to really make this what it needs to be. And the regulatory tailwinds hit at the right time. How did you stop this guy? Did you just crash the drone into him? No, I, look, it wasn't about <laughs> stopping him. The police on the ground could stop him. They just couldn't fight got him. It. Oh, got um, it. So you basically were just giving them like air. You were just telling them where yeah, they like were. Yeah, like a helicopter. And they, and they stopped him. Like, okay. Hey, your suspect's in a, a, you know, a, a white pallet truck, you know, headed westbound on Rockefeller and uh, just turned eastbound, you know, or northbound on this and yeah, this uh, is I, very like dystopian RoboCop, like, you know, like stop, right? You know, with the light from the drone, like coming at you, <laughs> like that's kind of terrifying. Is I that like what it. you're envisioning right now? I'm envisioning like, you know, the drone coming like, like at eye level and like, you know, shining a yeah. huge light in your face. Well, from we, a regulatory standpoint, can't get that low. Um, it's <laughs> about 400 feet in the air. People don't even realize it's there. Uh, so it's not as uh, sci-fi and scary as, as. But can we get there? Is like, is there a vision that we can get there with you? I, I don't know. Like, so actually the, the, my, my serious answer to that question is if you think about like the sci-fi drone gets down to eye level and goes halt. Yeah. Um, <laughs> there's a lot of like regulatory <laughs> autonomy that needs to be built into the drone for doing that. And then there needs to be a purpose for doing it because mm-hmm. ultimately the way we look at it is look, you're replacing this outdated system of like police helicopters that cost way more money are, you know, not nearly as effective and efficient um, and are extremely unsafe. I and mean, we've had a dozen fatal crashes on the public safety aviation side in the last 10 years. Uh, and they're terrible for the environment. Like the LAPD helicopter unit, uh, like their helicopters pollute the environment more than the top 10 private jets in the country combined every year. So it's like this outdated system. And you're doing the same thing with drones. You know, you're, you're responding to calls for service. You're helping, you know, high speed pursuits, like this kind of thing. Um, but you're doing it in a much better way. So you don't need to be below, you don't need to be like flying in people's faces to do that the same way that helicopters don't need to be doing that. Uh, so the vast majority of value you get at 400 feet, you can still zoom in and confirm a license plate at 400 feet. So you don't really need to get lower when you, what you're kind of talking about is like this, like need to intervene physically. Like I need Mm -hmm. to stop an action from happening with a drone. And right now the only use case that we have found that is compelling for us to explore is extinguishing fires, specifically Mm. wildfires, where, you know, our first version of this drone system can detect wildfires very, uh, very quickly and easily. You know, if you have a drone kind of circling these high wildfire areas in remote areas and being able to detect, oh, smoke, oh, thermals confirmed that's a drone or that's a, that's a fire. Let's send, uh, you know, resources there right now. So we have a chance of putting it out before it becomes something bigger. That's interesting. But if you talk to like NASA and department of forestry, they'll tell you like, Okay, if you detect a fire an hour earlier, we don't really give a shit because I can't send re- – like resources won't get there for a day because right. it's so remote. That's when we start exploring with this idea of like can we use larger drones to one-two punch. Small drone finds a fire. Large drone flies like three miles in that direction, shows up on top and either extinguishes it or surrounds it with fire retardant to prevent it from spreading. That's the only intervention that we've thought about like that's immediately compelling to us. So just to go back on – you know, this, this, um, this event where you're on duty and you went to, um, you know, assist, you know, field officers that are going in pursuit of this criminal. Was this just like a hobby drone that you had that you were doing it? Or was this like a police drone at the time? Off the shelf DJI drone. Uh, it, it, I mean, I wouldn't call it a hobby drone cause it was like DJI made it to be more of an enterprise level drone for like inspections and things. But like was that. it for the police department or was no. it just yours? Oh, uh, the first drone was actually donated by DGI. Okay. I reached out to them and it was COVID. So everyone's trying to help public safety. And I was like, can we get one? And they just gave it to us. Um, so I guess it was technically owned by the police department. Yeah. I was just thinking like, I mean, what kind of autonomy do they give, you know, you as an officer to like use these alternative ways to, you know, do your job? Well, everything I used to prove the concept was free at the time. Got it. I was able to get a free license for software that we needed to make happen there uh, free hardware. Um, we were, you know, launching off the rooftop of the hospital. The hospital allowed us to do that for free. The first thing I had to pay for was like internet access to the roof and someone actually wired the inner ethernet there. And it was a small enough amount that we could put it on like a Lieutenant's credit card. 
it wasn't until we had to like formalize these things in some capacity and I had to budget for like a year of using it that we had to like actually go through any budgetary process to make it happen. But I mean, how cool is that though, that a rank and file police officer can innovate within a department and use technology. I mean, like that's, I mean, I didn't know that that was a thing. Yeah. It's, it's super unusual that I I had um, a really supportive uh, chief of police, uh, this guy named Keith Kaufman who actually works uh, with us at Aerodome now. Uh, he retired, but um, really supportive police chief who is extremely like progressive in the sense of like, let's constantly try new things. And uh, my entire command staff, like all the way up to the captains as well uh, with Joe Hoffman and John Naylor that were out there um, were very uh, su- supportive of just being like, Hey man, what do you need? And like, just letting me be a one man show. Cause I, it wouldn't have, it would have been very difficult to do it outside of that. They were just uh, empowering me as a change agent and saying, just tell us what you need and trusting me to like come to them with the right information. And I put together a whole pilot program and it worked really well. And I earned the opportunity to do the next project. Right. Mm-hmm. Um, but this is not usual. Like it's not common for that to occur, especially as a reserve officer. I'm not even a full-time cop there anymore. I used to be. And now I'm just like a guy who shows up and helps every once in a while. Um, so it's, it's not usual. And I think the more government agencies that allow for some version of this, like that's where innovation comes from. Like that's what we did. So I'd hope that other departments that are listening to this, uh, find a few people in their agency that they're willing to empower to do special projects like this. So what regulation specifically allowed this to happen? Because I remember back in like when I started in VC in 2015, I felt like every, every venture portfolio had a drone company. It generally was an ag tech, you know, drone application, um, and then it just kind of died, right? Like, like the drone investment movement. And it sounds like there's like a resurgence in it. So we'd love to kind of hear about what, what loosening happened to, to allow this to, to come to bear. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I think the main regular, so it, like it's baby steps. First, we need to establish uh, a relationship with the FA and, um, as most agencies do, uh, with something called a COA, which is like a, a kind of a waiver that lets you, it's hard to explain, but lets you kind of fly outside of the regular part 107 FA guidelines. It doesn't really let you bend rules, but it's like the framework to get other waivers potentially. Then we got a waiver to be able to fly at nighttime. Um, we got a waiver to be able to, uh, eventually fly beyond visual line of sight. This is the most important waiver where currently if you're flying like a regular person flying, you know, a drone, you can't fly it beyond your ability to see that drone. Right. Um, and our beyond visual line of sight waiver was our first big step, but you still need a visual observer. Meaning even if you're flying like, let's say two miles in that direction, someone still needs to be able to see that drone two miles out. So it might be like a satellite person that you have out there, a patrol officer that's looking up and like watching the drone the entire time. Right. Um, Now, the big crack was in April of 2023, the first ever organization, it was a police department, small department in uh, Texas called Peerland, uh, got a waiver to be able to fly beyond visual line of sight without a visual observer. And they did it by installing these cameras around the city that pointed at the sky and allowed for, you know, the FAA to say, okay, if you can see the drone and deconflict it from aircraft with a camera, then we'll let you do that. But it's only good for daytime because you can't see it at nighttime and in clear conditions. And you have to be a thousand feet from any camera. That's not exactly a great way to like solve the problem from a unit economic standpoint for a business. But it was a great way to show that like the FAA is willing to, to play ball here and like be open to these these like safe al- safer alternatives. Essentially, you had to prove the FAA that you can either be as good as the human eye and the, like the human ability to deconflict a drone from an aircraft or be better. So this opened up the, the world for... Like Zipline, for example, major company to get their first waiver beyond visual line of sight without a visual observer this last year, too, after waiting 10 years in America to be able to do this. And it opened up the world for companies like us to be able to go, okay, let's take this to the next level. Let's use ground based radar in the same way that the FAA deconflicts aircraft. Um, and let's use radio frequency sensors and ADSB sensors and remote ID sensors and build essentially like an air traffic control for each city to be able to do the exact same thing. So, um, we, you know, that's the process we're doing with the FA now, where you can fly without a visual observer, not just daytime, nighttime, but uh, or daytime, but you can fly at nighttime. You can fly in not super clear conditions. You can fly three and a half nautical miles away from the ground station. You can, you know, be able to fly it almost like you would a, an aircraft, so you can replace the need for a helicopter. So, um, from what I gathered from that 
you essentially can get these waivers on a department level if you're a police you know, officer or, mm-hmm. or police force, or you can get it on a company level. Yeah. Like, so there are some companies that are getting similar waivers. They're almost like a blanket across the product. Okay. That's like, Hey, if you use this product, great. Uh, you don't need to get like your own individual waiver per perhaps. I don't know how effective, like that sounds great. I, I don't know how, like I have like less of a bet on that. I think the, the, the bigger step is like, just show the FA that, an organization or individual pilot using your technology can effectively be safe because they're using your technology and allow the FA to eventually templatize that if they want to. But right now it's police department level. The police department would apply and say, Hey, we're using the Aerodome technology to be able to do this. Here's the waiver submission. And the FA goes, okay, good enough. And then submits it per agency. But what a great, what a great business mode, right? For you yeah. as somebody early to be able to go in there and a, be the, the trail runner. You want to be first if there's going to be regulations, right? So you can yeah. help form the regulations and be able to work with these, um, with these departments to actually build, you know, uh, a system that works for everybody. Yeah, no, it's, it's exactly it. Um, on the regulatory side, like I, I'm not a big fan of moats when it's like, uh, it's like anti-competitive, right? Mm-hmm. So like, I don't want to create a regulatory mo- moat that would make Bill Gurley groan, mm-hmm. but a regulatory moat where you're basically increasing, it's a competitive moat. It where, just slows like, it down. I mean, just, it just, it makes you more intentional. And yeah, we're, you, we're, we're, if we're raising the bar for safety mm-hmm. to make a, a safer experience for people, and the FA goes, okay, the bar is now raised. And now competitors have to go, okay, we have to meet this new standard to mm-hmm. be able to, uh, to, to be able to effectively provide this service because it's a safer standard. I'm okay with that because the end outcome is that everyone is now safer and better because of it. Um, and I, that's, that's kind of the approach that we're taking. Right, right, exactly. It just kind of puts, it just doesn't allow any person to, you know, white label a drone and sell it to, <laughs> you know, essentially a police force at the lowest possible cost. Uh, for technology and a practice of, of, you know, right. serving their community. Um, that's, you know, uh, new. Right. Yeah. Um, and so you went to raise some funding and you have recorded here that you raised a six and a half million dollar seed round mm-hmm. by 2048 and a 16 Z. So tell us a little bit about that. Yeah. So, um, 2048 is, uh, you know, it's run by my first ever investor, Alex Iskold. He was the managing director of Techstars New York in 2015. He wrote me my first check at the last company. And then it was just kind of kismet because as I was thinking, okay, this is the thing we're going to do. Like, you know, we're going to, we're going to form this up before I, and I was originally thinking, I'll just, you, you know, my co-founder and I, who's also the co-founder of my last company, will just kind of spend enough money on this of our, like our own cash to just prove the concept. Uh, I get a text from Alex. He's like, Hey buddy, I've got this, like, I don't know if you're thinking about starting any companies anytime soon, but there's this problem I really want to solve. And he starts getting into a big portion of what we're talking about, which is like, you know, this thesis that the, the, the airspace from zero to 400 feet is going to become more commercialized. And, and so someone's got, you know, got to come and fill the gap and like help track it and make it safe. And which is part of what we have to do to enable agencies to re- respond to one calls. I'm like, that's hilarious. You're saying this because that's what we're going to be doing. And I get on a call with him. He's like, you got it. Like, let's do it. And he's like, term sheet. I want to go. I want to go. And I'm like, I don't know, Alex, like I might want to use my own money. He's like, no, that's the stupidest thing I've ever heard. You're not equipped to take this level of risk. Who do you think you are? You don't have like a billion dollars. Just, <laughs> just go do this. It's like and what I, I tell you every weekend when I look at your Instagram feed. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it's like, who do you think you are? You're not a billionaire. Yeah. 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 <laughs> well, you know, I just, uh, <laughs> guy's got to enjoy himself. Okay. Dude, exactly. Guy's got to enjoy himself. Um, but so then I, I'm like, okay, uh, let's, let's think about this. I fly to New York. I moved to New York and, um, where he is. And then I go to like an Andreessen kind of cocktail event and I meet David Yulovich and David's like, I want to do this. This sounds great. Let's do it. You know, and we start talking about it. Um, and David's great. David's, you know, he's a, an investor in Andro and Skydio and flock safety. Like he really understands the space coming out of the American dynamism team. Michelle Voles also on that team. Like I, I spent time with both of them and I'm like, all right, well that like, I can just put these, you know, 2048 injuries and we can put a round together right now. Let's just go. So we, uh, put that round together, uh, brought in a couple friends, you know, old investors from spider tech, uh, to join the fray. You know, they were, they were great investors for us. So I want to make sure they had their, uh, they, they were able to wet their beak. And then, um, brought on one or two new ones, like friends that I've made along the way. And we, we cranked that one out. It's weird. I didn't get a call. 
Yeah, I, I said it was like friends mostly. Yeah. Got it. Got yeah, it. Not yeah, just yeah. like acquaintances that you yeah, met. Yeah. 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 <laughs> guys, guys who send me nasty DMs on Instagram. <laughs> Dang, I shouldn't be eating <laughs> pasta at Carbone on a Thursday night. Um, okay, so for the audience that doesn't know about the thematic um, initiatives by A16Z, uh, by Catherine Boyle and Michelle Voles on American Dynamism, can you just explain what that is to the to the audience? Yeah, so American Dynamism uh, generally, and I don't want to botch their pitch, but look, th- there's obviously a thesis of like, we should invest in things that... Uh, not just like strengthen the American resolve and build American industry, but um, also get into the world of defense and safety and and protect American interests and American people. Um, It's like this idea that we've kind of strayed away from everything we have to build uh, has to be good for the world, which is great. And, you know, we agree with that, but building something with the idea of like, let's make it great for the country and then make it great for the world. Isn't inherently a bad thing to do. Um, And I think as they kind of invest in things, that, uh, you know, potentially build infrastructure or build, bring jobs back home and, and do these kinds of things. Um, I, I think like the thesis is that there's a lot that's like, there's an intersection between what is good for the country what is good for the world and what is good for Andreessen and Horowitz. And I think that's, uh, that's where a lot of that pitch comes into play. Again, if do you, or, you know, uh, Michelle or Catherine hear this and go, Hey, you didn't pitch that really well. I apologize. We can sit down and you can help me uh, understand better, but that's, that's, that's the way I've seen it. And it's, uh, I, like, I think it's a really important mission. I'm also seeing other firms replicate this within their firms. Like I've talked to other top tier firms that are kind of building a similar approach. Gotcha. You know, um, I was thinking just about the American dynamism approach. And I think there's just another parallel market, um, uh, market dynamic uh, with that is that I just feel like there's legacy stodgier industries like public safety, like mm-hmm. aerospace, like defense. They've just been underserved by tech because they haven't been really big early adopters. And I think yeah. like the early adopter camp in the market, early stage SaaS companies buying other early stage SaaS company software, that's kind of oversaturated. But there's this whole like laggard piece of the market, uh, utility companies, public safety um, uh, tax, right. They really can start adopting stuff and really make yeah. a big difference. Well, there's a Venn diagram. If, if you saw the Venn diagram of like industries and companies and problems and solutions that benefit America, you know, and Americans specifically. And then you saw another circle of like, um, these types of lagging industries. It's a very overlapping Venn diagram. Everything you just mentioned, by the way, in your example, is like a great use case for American dynamism. Can we have people come in here and solve for energy infrastructure in the country and like re- reduce, uh, you know, um, dependence on on like foreign semiconductors? They're like things like that uh, all the way down, which is like sounds like an unsexy problem with like slow sales cycles and a lot of capital investment to public safety or defense. Or, you know, uh, being able to like bring manufacturing back home in some capacity. Like, these are not problems that you can just like have overnight successes in. You're not going to build a unicorn in like a year trying to solve one right. of these problems. And so typically like venture has looked for things where you can find rapid success and those aren't those things. And those industries have been neglected and Andreessen came in and said, you know, there's a, there's a perfect touch point here where we can actually – now these industries have been lag, lagging so long, we can show up and make a big impact. And we're okay with the fact that it might take 10 years uh, to, to build a, a big unicorn here because um, we can be the largest capital provider potentially. And this is going to be great for the country. And it's okay to be a little patriotic when you, when you give out your dollars and make investments. There's nothing wrong with that. So um, on the hardware side, yeah. Is there like a supply chain regulation since that you are attacking, you know, you are servicing uh, municipalities? Does the hardware need to be sourced in the United States? Um, I'd say the closest that we see to something like that. And so the short answer is no. You know, America is not a country where, you know, at least federally, there's like a, a rule that says everything you have to build has to be built here. If you go to other countries, like smaller countries, especially there are kind of, you know, they want to 
build the spirit of like solving problems themselves, which is great, independence, and also rewarding and creating jobs in the country. In America, there's like, you know, we're, we're like the number one melting pot. We have the largest GDP. Like there's, there's less of a need to limit ourselves and more of like a desire to always have the best thing. And at the municipal level, I'd say that's also true. What I would say the caveat is that there is a movement in the United States um, that is doesn't want that, like we don't want government customers or customers kind of using this for for key infrastructure to uh, be to be using hardware that is me- like made by countries that we do not consider allies. Right. And China is probably the best example. Right. So there's like an act in Congress that's constantly being passed around that uh, prevents federal customers from using DJI drones. Because it's, the idea is like, what if those drones, you know, could technically be used where that data and that video feed goes back to China and then, you know, can be used against American interests. DJI obviously comes out and says, hey, here are all the ways that we're making sure that doesn't happen. But ultimately, like, is that satisfactory to the lawmakers? Probably not. And how much of that is actually, you know, just politicians being politicians and like picking key factors that sound scary to the American people and kind of using FUD to drive votes and, and policy, you know, it's, it's kind of hard to tell. But the problem with this approach is I actually completely agree with the idea. Like I'd love for us to have American made hardware and for America to be competitive in that space. And for us to be able to like invest in these American companies that then go and build these products that we can use that are as good, if not better than Chinese competitors. Like I'm all about that. The problem is when we pass legislation that outpaces that innovation and then rip out the tools like DJI tools from people who are using that to save lives today without giving them effective alternatives to be able to do that. And that's sure. a, right. kind of something that's happening right now where you go to like Florida and they've passed a ban that doesn't allow police departments to use DJI drones to, to do anything from like search and rescue to, you know, our use case. And so now these police departments are like, all right, well, let's use the next best drone. And the next best drone isn't nearly as capable. And instead of the government going, let's go subsidize and pay for companies in America to be able to reach that level of innovation because it's a multi-billion dollar effort to be able to do that. You know, DJI is so far ahead and spent so much money on this for so many years. You can't just do that out of nothing. Yeah. Uh, They just went straight and banned it first. And then we're like, oh, let's take a couple of years to fix this out or figure this out. Um, So it's kind of careless, but that's, that's kind of where we're at right now. Yeah. Second, third, fourth order effects matter. Big time. Uh, Yeah. But but it's rare to see second and Forget like third or fourth. It's rare to see like second order effects be considered when passing legislation. It's usually like they they simplify and they move because it's a very difficult and complicated process to pass legislation. It needs to be simple enough for the the average American to understand, and it needs to be considered a win. And then it gets omnibus into massive bills. That's a whole different problem. Don't curse on my show. Don't say mm. stuff like omnibus. Sorry, man. Sorry, dude. So sorry. How's your, how's your poker game? Uh, it hasn't improved. <laughs> so I don't want to play with your ringers just so the audience knows David's played poker uh, at my house and I've like played poker, David, and he has this history of bringing like world-class ringers to the game <laughs> and I'm sure staking them outside of the game and they, they leave like in first or second place. And the guy's just like, all right, see you guys. And doesn't smoke cigars or drink with the rest of us. And it doesn't like misses dinner and just shows up. So if anyone ever gets invited to a David poker game, he's, oh, this is my buddy Trey or something like that. <laughs> get skeptical real fast. Yeah. And he's got like a hoodie. Like, over yeah, oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. <laughs> hoodie and sunglasses. <laughs> Friendly game, guy. What are, you, what are we doing here? Yeah. And it's somehow like I'm not upset for losing. Like I just. Yeah. You're out. like, oh, man. Oh, Trey won. Ah, sorry, guys. <laughs> yeah. And then he leaves with them. Yeah. I'm out we'll first. Share an Uber. Yeah. <laughs> it's always uh, Uber Black. Yeah. So what's, uh, what are you excited about this year? Like just generally in the industry or just for the company? Just in general. Yeah. Um, well, let's start with the company. I'd say, you know, we're, uh, I can't get into the details, but we're closing a series A right now, which we're super excited about. Um, we are live in three police departments and, uh, just uh, we're doing tests and two additional ones right now. We're launching a few others in the next quarter. Super excited about, uh, watching the impact of the company it, we've already, you know, done. We like the agency have used this technology to save lives, respond to that one calls, uh, do all the things we wanted to use. So I'm excited to see the product develop. I'm excited to see, you know, work with the FA this year. We've got a lot of progress there to to open up what we're trying to do. Um, you know, we've got a, a, a fixed swing drone that we're uh, hoping to launch this year as well. That I'm, I'm super excited about building the team. You know, everything that goes with making this company successful over the next 12 months is probably the most exciting thing to me. The other side of this is where I see like what I'm excited about in technology this year. I think 
everyone's excited to see how AI develops over the next year. I mean, it's, it's like a boring almost conversation now that's kind of funny. We've talked about it so much that people are just like, oh, okay, stop talking about AI. But like seeing where the big players come into play, seeing who comes into the fray as well, um, I think it's going to be really interesting. I think we're going to see the advancement of specific use cases in AI. I'm excited to see the combination of AI and robotics this year. Mm-hmm. I think combining bits and atoms there is going to be really, really interesting. Um, so I'm super excited about that. I think consumer-based AI and how that becomes ingrained into everyday life is going to happen very quickly as major companies like Apple and Amazon get into the fray of just making it part of our everyday lives versus like smaller players, which I think are going to show up with things that are some, some might be adopted, some might not. So I'm excited about that. Uh, I'm excited to see, I don't know if excited is this word, a word I'd use, but uh, I, there's going to be a show in America that is called the 2024 election. That's going to, uh, cause a lot of an impact on a lot of things. Uh, so I'd let's say less excited about that more than I am, you know, curious about how that's going to pan out. So that's going to be something. It's definitely going to be the best show on TV in 2024. It's going to be the best show on TV <laughs> that everyone wants to watch, like a, an airplane crashing into the ground. Like it's a tr- slow train crash. And we're like, mm-hmm. God, we have to watch it, but we wish we didn't have to. So that's going to I, I, I believe that 30% of the population on both sides is going to become mentally ill. Like it's going to gonna bring it out of people for sure. Totally. It's going to yeah. bring out like, <laughs> like sure. it's just like a lot of triggers. Yeah. I mean, it's going to be polarized again. You know, I feel like 2020 to 2024, I'd see like some people felt like the polarization increase. I don't think that's the case. I think we have different problems from 2020 to 2024, but I feel like people started kind of slowly coming back to the middle. My, my barometer for this also happens to be policing, like policing in 2020 and how everyone felt about it. And it was like a, a crazy time frame to 2024 feels way more reasonable and everyone's kind of calmed down. And I think that's been the case for a lot of things. So I'm not excited for those polls to come back out and rip people into two sides again. Yeah. Hopefully it doesn't happen again. Everybody, thank you so much for listening. Um, we have founders like Raul and great investors and operators every single week. If you liked it, please subscribe, tell a friend, and we'll see you next week. Thanks. Bye-bye. See you guys. Thank you for tuning in to the Capital Stack Podcast. Make sure to share this with someone you know that can benefit from this content. Remember to support this show by rating, reviewing, and subscribing. David Paul is the founder and general partner at DWP Capital. All opinions expressed by David and podcast guests are solely their own opinions and do not reflect the opinion of DWP Capital. This podcast is for informational purposes only and should not be relied upon for decisions. David and guests may maintain positions in the securities discussed on this podcast.